Hi, this is Buriana. Welcome to my channel Art Unplugged. In this video, I want to talk to you about women artists and their role in history, starting from the Renaissance. If somebody asks you who are the 10 greatest artists of all time, chances are that Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael will be the top of your list. And certainly all 10 names will be of men. And if you are asked who are the top 10 female artists of all time, almost certainly all names will be of artists from the 20th and 21st century. Why is that? Is it that women throughout history didn't make art worth mentioning? Or is it that women artists are not worth mentioning? And anyway, how is the historical worth of an artist determined? Let's see. Obviously, this is a huge subject. That's why I would like to start from the Renaissance, when the first proper art history book was written by Giorgio Vasari. The Renaissance was a time when a major shift in thinking, known as humanism, started in Italy and spread to the rest of Western Europe. It impacted all spheres of life, but most of all, the visual arts. The essence of humanism is that it views man rather than God as the center of his own universe and that people should embrace human achievements in education, arts, literature and science. Man, yes. Woman, not really. Because in the Renaissance hardly anything changed in the lives of women. A woman couldn't own property, testify in court, or earn an income. Women were largely confined to the home. A woman was the property of her father and once married of her husband. In preparation for their role as mothers, girls from noble families did receive some education, which included literacy, art, music, embroidery, but it all ended the moment they were married. And that happened usually at the age of 14 to 15, Career options, become a bride to a man chosen by your family or a bride to Jesus, 50-50. In either case, you needed a dowry. And since Jesus accepted lower amounts, about half of all educated girls in that era were placed into convents. If you became a wife, you ran a high risk of dying at childbirth, estimated 2 to 4%. And since chances were that you would be pregnant several times, I'm not sure how the maths work here, but it doesn't look good to me at all. The other option was to become a nun, which was more or less comparable to a lifelong lockdown with no internet and home deliveries. The upside, you are unlikely to die at childbirth and you can expand your reading in the monastic library. Humanism looks more like manism to me. Nevertheless, women found it in them to make art that was relevant to the times that were changing around them. Around them, but not for them, because not much had changed in their lives since the Middle Ages. Most of the female artists of the Renaissance and after that have been ignored by art history. Nevertheless, there were some great female artists even in that period and I want to tell you about three amazing women who beat the odds and became really important artists. Sister Plautilla Nelli, born in 1524, was a self-taught non-artist and the first known woman Renaissance painter of Florence. Look at her work. Paintings like this are a result of a complicated process. You start with sketches from life, if you had one, that is. Next, you make an underpainting in neutral colors called grisaille, then followed by several layers of color until you achieve the depth and luminosity that you see here. 
that in addition to grinding your pigments, mixing them into paint, prepping your canvas, even making your own brushes. Can you imagine having to figure out how this is done all by yourself inside a convent? All the training Plotil and Nelly received consisted of copying works of three artists, Bronzino, Andrea del Sarto and Fra Bartolomeo. Studying the nude figure from life was unthinkable. She became nun at 14, so chances are that she'd never seen a naked man in her life. The subject matter of her works were religious scenes, of course. There is a slightly depressing air of lifelessness about them, but then note the wistful tenderness of these faces. Here was a woman who was allowed to love no one but God all her life. So she poured all her unrealized human emotion into the protagonists of her paintings. In 1560, Nelly painted The Last Supper, the first woman ever to do that. The painting is a staggering 7 by 2 meters, a daring endeavor for a non-artist of that period. She signed her work Pray for the Paintress after her name, confirming her role and her gender. The next artist I chose to tell you about is Lavinia Fontana. She was born 27 years after Plautilla in Bologna. Lavinia Fontana became the first female career artist in Western Europe, earning an independent income from her commissions. Fontana was married without a dowry on the assumption that she would earn her upkeep through painting. But she did more than that. She became the breadwinner for her family and her husband served as her agent, assistant and raised their children. Here is her self-portrait at the Virginal with a servant, which she painted when she was 25, a betrothal gift for her future husband. She looks him right in the eye as if to say, look at me, I am a classy woman who dresses in style and has a servant. And I am educated too, I can play an instrument. And I am a professional painter. Lavinia Fontana trained at her father's studio. Her family, though not noble, moved among well-educated circles, which valued the education of women. Bologna's university also accepted women, and Fontana earned the degree of dottoressa, something extremely rare for a woman. Lavinia was an excellent painter and just as good a promoter of herself. She cultivated close friendships with the Bolognese noble women, and by the 1580s, they were competing for her services, paying her handsome commissions. Through one of her important sitters, Lavinia got herself an introduction to the Vatican and moved to Rome with her family at the invitation of the Pope. She thrived there too, and was subsequently appointed as portraitist in ordinary at the Vatican, and Pope Paul V himself was among her sitters. Lavinia Fontana is also believed by some to be the first woman to paint the nude, though some researchers dispute that. Here are some of the nudes that she painted quite masterfully. Lavinia Fontana received numerous honors. She was elected into the Academy of San Luca in Rome, a rare honor for a woman. Her career spanned for 30 years. And in the process of all that, she gave birth to 11 children, 11, no epidurals, no running water and electricity. It's 30% of her active time spent pregnant. I cannot begin to imagine. And now we come to Artemisia Gentileschi, one of the most accomplished Baroque artists working in the dramatic style of Caravaggio. She's the only one you can find in the history books, but there is something more to her art than what is written there. Her father was an artist, so she could learn the complex skills needed to paint in the Baroque style from her father, although otherwise it is said that she was hardly literate. When she was 18, she was raped by Agostino Tassi, the man who was hired to teach her. 
her father took him to court. The resulting trial lasted several months and shocked Rome. Artemisia had to testify and was tortured to ensure that she was telling the truth. Nobody tortured her rapist. And in the end he was acquitted because he was on the Pope's good books. That's the 1600s for you. And the 1700s. And the 1800s. And the 1900s. And, well, without the torture, the 2000s. But we're going to change that. This is her most famous work, Judith and Holofernes. The dying man is Holofernes, an enemy of the Israelites in the Old Testament. And the young woman beheading him is Judith, his divinely appointed assassin. Or oh, isn't the man Agustino Tassi, Artemisia's rapist, and the woman with the sword, Artemisia Gentileschi herself? This is effectively a self-portrait. Gentileschi was taking her revenge with the only weapon she had, her paintbrush. On the canvas, she could change the ending of the story, as her painting of Judith and Holofernes show. But there is something else here. Gentileschi brings a new element to the biblical story. In most paintings, Judith has a servant who waits for the severed head. In Gentileschi's version, the servant is another strong young woman who actively participates in the killing, which brings a revolutionary implication. What wonders Gentileschi if women got together? Could we fight against a world ruled by men? In 1612, when she was only 17, she painted Susanna and the Elders. The biblical story of Susanna, a virtuous Jewish woman preyed upon by two judges, important members of the community. The story has been painted many times and its interpretations vary from the moralist to the voyeuristic. But look at Artemisia's take. We see a Susanna cringing in disgust while the perverts are hovering threateningly over her. This is again Artemisia painting her own life. As it turned out, her rapist had an accomplice and both had been hanging around, harassing her, watching her, just like the old man troubling Susanna. What I admire about her work is that, though it's highly autobiographical, there is not a trace of self-pity in it. On the contrary, it emits ruthless, visceral power. Look at her self-portrait the unusual angle, as if to say, I'm an unusual woman, the muscular body, the lack of any idealization of the face. Gentileschi achieved something so groundbreaking, so close to impossible, that she deserves to be one of the most famous artists in the world. It is not simply that she became a highly successful artist, in an age when guilds and academies closed their doors for women. She was the first of them to communicate a powerful personal vision. Gentileschi was the first artist of the pre-modern era to take a stand against oppression of women. And that, in my books, makes her the first feminist artist in history. I don't know about you, but of all women artists that I read about during my research for this video, the only one that I knew beforehand was Artemisia Gentileschi. Which brings us to the question that we started with. Why are women artists ignored by art history, even those who achieved fame and recognition in their own time? And how is the historical worth of an artist determined? I think women have been left out of art history because until now the definition of historical significance has been formulated from a singular male perspective. Fortunately, things are changing nowadays. It is enough to Google the subject to see that. I hope you found this video interesting. 
Please like it, share and subscribe if you haven't done that already. Also, if you want to see the work of this woman painter, please follow me on Instagram or Pinterest on Facebook. Links below. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you very soon. Bye.